Composers want to do everything. They want to write for every every medium, film, TV, video games, podcasts, movie trailers, blah, blah, blah. And it, ugh, it just becomes this shotgun. I'll take whatever I can get. Those people don't become successful because they're not focused. Yeah, hey like what's going on? So I've been working on uh, music packs. Okay. Particularly uh, me and my brother actually collaborate together. And we, uh, we have previously uploaded like a collection of RPG music tracks. So now we're trying to do like a part two collection. Hmm. So in terms of that, that's where we're heading to. And then also for my own individual composing, I'm composing for two games right now. One's for a charity company called Games for Love. Cool. And another is uh, called Neko Ghost Jump. It's kind of like a 2D, 3D puzzle platform game. Yeah. And I'm also doing the sound, sound effects and implementation of that. Oh, that's really fun. I didn't realize you were doing sound design as well. How's that part been going? Like, I would say it's not my complete passion, but I'm kind of enjoyed to do, do it anyways. Yeah, it's a great learning opportunity for sure. What can I help you with today? All right, so my first question is that I host a YouTube channel called Music Design, which several people have commented on that it's a very unique idea, but my primary goal right now is to try to build my audience. So what kind of marketing techniques have you found that work for your own YouTube content? Ooh, that's a great question. YouTube is kind of its own beast and it really has to be treated separately from social media and email and all the other platforms that we can do. Um, I think ultimately it depends on what your end goal is because there are really two completely different paths you can take. And I find that composers, because we are artists and because we, we want to share our art, thus have a following, we don't typically think about the monetization side and the money side. But the trap is if we go the money side without the following side, we could easily fall into a pit and, and hurt the very people that we're trying to serve. So let's start with that. What, um, what is your end goal? Why do you want a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube or beyond for just my own enjoyment. I actually do enjoy making these videos because it's great practice for me, for my own composing skills to kind of recreate songs. Yeah. But on the monetization kind of side of things, I'm planning to release a music course kind of like yeah. based on this music design idea. So like once I build that audience, I then try to, well, try to plan that kind of, without that course. Okay. Um, I'm going to challenge you with something. This is a, a, a trap that I've fallen into many times before, and it's, it's pretty simple, and yet we miss it all the time. Um, anytime you create a product before the market asks for it, you're kind of doomed to fail. And it's a harsh reality that none of us want to accept as truth. Um, but I would much rather you build the audience and then naturally, organically from their comments and their engagement and by talking with them and finding out what is their actual problem, what's their actual pain point, what do they actually need and want, then make that very thing and it'll sell like crazy. And I've seen this personally in so many different ways with courses. And that's actually something that I'm doing right now. And it's so humbling because it doesn't really matter how long you've been doing this you kind of have to restart at square one every time. Um, anytime you want to serve your, your market, serve your audience. Um, and that's why I actually love YouTube so much. And I don't know if your um, videos would also work as a podcast. Some do, some don't. Um, but I would also explore that option just to see if that, just to reach a different market and to, to better serve them too. Because um, ultimately people are very challenged with time and people can listen to a podcast so much more frequently and for longer periods of time than watching a video. So I don't know if there's a translation there, but that might be helpful. But if the goal is right now to monetize it into a course, I don't think what you are doing is going to get you there. I, I just see that not that it won't be successful or like fulfilling. And I do believe that what you're doing is helping people, but I don't think it has monetization on it yet. That's, that's my biggest encouragement there is grow the audience first and then create the product. 
Because the other way around, mm -hmm. you're just going to get frustrated and you're going to put a lot of energy into marketing. You might spend some money and in investing into marketing and it's not going to go anywhere because it's not what people actually want. And what's crazy about this, I'll stand on my soapbox for a second. Uh, what's crazy about this is you could make the best course ever and it could be amazing and be transforming and life-changing for exactly who you think it's going to be for. But if they don't believe that, they'll never buy it. And it has to organically come from them. And this stinks because it, it takes patience, it takes time, and it takes studying and researching and analyzing what your audience is asking for. And this is something, and I'm, I'm sure you've noticed or picked up on some of this with my own email marketing, et cetera. I, I recently have been uh, sending a lot more questions and having a lot more one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. And it takes so much time, especially when you're sending these things to thousands of people and many of them reply, which is kind of crazy that, you know, 10% will reply. And now I have hundreds of emails to reply back to, and it, it takes me a little while, but those are so telling. And those types of one-on-one -on -one conversations, they, people are honest. If you give them that opportunity in a private conversation, to be honest, they will be. And you could do the same thing with social media DMs or obviously in person. I don't know if you have the, the if you can text or, or call any of the people in your audience, but there's nothing better than honesty and honest feedback because people will tell you exactly what's going on. They'll say, you know what? That is something that I am actually interested in, but, and here's the common thread. And, and since we're talking about products, this is probably a good conversation, a good angle to go. Most people, will say, oh, it's too expensive, right? So this is like in this scenario, if you continue with what you're doing and you create the product, trying to force and sell it, people will always respond with, that looks cool and interesting, but one of two things, it's too expensive, which is a lie, or it is, they'll say something to the effect of, it's not something I need right now. And either way, regardless of which one they're, they're saying, I think that there is an actual third answer that they're not saying. The truth that they're not saying is that's not valuable or that's, that will not help me. And that's what they're really saying by not buying because when something's valuable and the right price, they always buy. We always do this as humans. And that is not a path I want for you. So kind of rewinding, focus on your audience first. Does that help? Absolutely. So is there any kind of like now that I'm trying to just focus on building the audience, what are some kind of ways to build that up? Sure. Um, consistency more than anything. It's really, it's really a combo of consistency and quality. Consistency just means do it regularly, put it on your calendar, put it in your schedule for me once a week. And then it eventually turned into twice a week. Um, and I do two different shows, so they kind of serve different purposes. But I think once a week, no less than once a week, is kind of the the, the prerequisite for doing YouTube well today. Um, some people can do two or three or five a week, but it's very unsustainable. And it doesn't, in my case, it doesn't protect my family. And something I have found over time is the only way to be sustainable for me is to put it in my calendar to do it the same way every week. So for me, just to be practical here, Friday mornings are my recording day. I don't even always record on Fridays, but it's in my calendar. And if I have some videos I wanna knock out, I'll do them in bulk, I'll do multiple. And then I have those for the next few weeks and months to, to edit down and, and do that kind of stuff. Um, and I find that that kind of mentality of a routine is very, very important because that's how my consumers, that's how my, my audience is expecting. They're expecting that, oh, every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, there's going to be another YouTube video, another podcast episode. They expect every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, there's going to be the live composing show where I'm working on live projects. And that's just the, that's the way that I've set it up for me. But it's setting expectations because ultimately any client and um, business relationship is, is predicated on expectations. This is true of one-on-one -on -one service-based businesses, obviously as a composer, but also with clients, if you're gonna be selling courses or game packs, whatever, 
you're, you're establishing trust. And the only way to build trust is to be consistent over time. No one trusts immediately. I mean, why should they, right? You haven't delivered over time. And so that's the, the, the consistency piece. But on the other side, it's the quality piece. Now, quality is not, it doesn't just mean do everything to the highest possible standard. I think that's kind of a prerequisite as well. It's like, if you're going to do this, do your best, duh. But there's another layer to it. And that's quality has to do with, are you creating appropriate content? Is it actually what your audience wants? How long have you been doing this particular segment of your show? Well, like a year and a half or so. Okay, so you have a lot of data. I'm not sure how much time you spent in your YouTube analytics dashboard, but it is very telling. In about two minutes, you can look through that data and you can find out really quickly what are the top three videos? What is everyone engaging on? What are the videos they're actually commenting on, asking questions about? And you're going to find some trends immediately that are going to be very, very insightful. And I've done this. I don't do it as much as I should, but probably every three to six months, I'll sit down, look at my YouTube analytics and just have some fun looking at it. Oh, wow. There's a lot of people who liked that music business content, but not many people liked the technology stuff or they loved the production stuff, but they weren't too much into the music theory, right? There's just, there's different trends you're going to find. And for me, time and time again, Mind you, I never listened to it until recently, but people would always say the same thing. They always had questions about video games. They always had um, conversations about video games. I would, I would make a film video. I would make a thing about movie trailers and about TV composing and about podcasts. No one cared. And I was so upset because I care. But then the more I realized my audience was talking back to me, just not verbally, they were saying with their views and with their um, watch length. And when I do my live streams, it's very, very obvious. If you look at the numbers, like it's a, I always talk about the 80, 20 principle and how, you know, that's a very uh, great way to make decisions in life. Um, 80% of my audience were absolutely 100% in on game music. Only 20% cared about the other stuff. It doesn't make it more valuable in general, it just makes it more valuable to them. And so it makes a whole lot of sense for me to spend my time teaching that subject. And I think you've already gathered that because obviously you have a pretty niche thing with, with music and sound design within video games, but maybe you can go deeper. I think you should have enough data after a year and a half. You're going to be able to tell pretty quickly what are the exact topics that people resonate with. And if you're still stumped and you're like, what do I do now? YouTube has an amazing community feature that you can post and you can put polls exactly like social media, or you can even just make a video and have people comment below, make a two minute video explaining where you're at. People love that authenticity and that humility because ultimately you're there to serve them. So if you don't know what they want, you're not going to be serving them. And people are very opinionated and they want to share what they want, especially if they've been following you for a while. So I think that communication is a big part of it. But to sum that up, it's the consistency as well as the appropriateness or the, the, um, the quality. Uh, I and many other people feel difficulty in, in investing in ourselves. Mm. So this could be kind of addressing our biggest problems and fears, like investing in our own education, reaching out to people for help. So what advice would you give to someone who struggles being too comfortable and not kind of investing? Um, I'll borrow from a book I recently read called Success is Not an Accident. I highly encourage that book, but it's also a very tough book, a very long book. But one of the, the nuggets from there that I've been really wrestling down is whenever you invest, this is energy, time, money, whatever. Whenever you invest, it should be an automatic yes if it's going to have a 10x return. It should be an automatic no if it's not. It's a pretty simple formula, if you will. And that has actually really, really helped me recently because I'm at a place right now in business that I want to see that level of growth. I want to see growth and I want it to be exponential because I think we all want growth in every area of our lives. But um, as far as business goes, we really want to see 
the actions we take have a have a result. It, it sounds kind of silly to say it out, out loud, but it's like no, no one wants to go make a game music pack or a course and they sell it. And then it's like, what the heck? Why is no one interested? Right? We want to make sure that the actions we do matter. So if you believe it's a 10x return, then do it. And this is, I think, a pretty easy way. Maybe it's oversimplifying, but I, I really don't think it is. Uh, even things like college education or going to a conference, basic education investment. Do you believe that spending $50,000 on an education is going to have a 10x return? Maybe, maybe not. That is a real decision you're going to have to make. I like to think of, I try, I'm, I try to uh, envision that six months to a year is a really good window. This is not part of that book, but it's just kind of my own personal opinion that I believe that if you make an investment, another filter here is, will I see this money back in six to 12 months? I think it's a really good standard um, because I know with education, you might not see that money for 10 years, right? And that, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can say that's a good investment. Um, but for example, uh, Simple Samples Audio, that's a big part of my time right now as I'm um, investing, truly investing, because it's a startup company where I'm, I'm creating contact instruments. And my skill set is limited. I can do quite a bit of that. I'm learning programming and I'm obviously as a composer and musician, I, I have a natural sense for what is a good instrument and what's bad. But still, my, my programming skills are very subpar. And what I've been doing through this process is I do as much as I can, about 80%. And then I say, I really want this feature. I really want this certain musician to record. And then I offload it. And it costs lots of money to do this. But what I've already learned is I've been making that decision every single time. Will this have a 10x return? If I spend $6,000 on this thing right now, which is a lot of money to spend on anything, but if I'm going to spend $6,000 on this right now, should I expect $60,000 income in return in the next six to 12 months? And I think the answer is yes. And, and that's how I can move forward. When it comes to using software or, or investing in sample instruments or DAWs or education, whatever, you can apply this to anything. But I really think that should be a pretty hard yes or no in our brains before we do it. Because otherwise, you're going to be just freaking out the whole time. Because if you go and spend, say, $6,000 on something and you're not seeing the money back, you're going to start to panic and you're going to kind of be in this fearful state. And that's not a good place to be in business or otherwise. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's not that there's a guarantee behind investments, but it's something I'm learning big time is the larger the investment and the more you believe in it, um, basically go big or go home. It, 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 there's a risk component, right? So we should do whatever we can to mitigate the risk behind these investments. Um, but at the end of the day, your level of growth and your speed of growth is directly proportionate to the amount of risk you take. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to go spend $6,000 on something, you make sure that you have savings. You make sure that your business is taken care of, your family is taken care of, and you're not gambling. I don't promote gambling. I promote in true investing knowing that something's going to have that return. So I am curious, what are you looking into investing for? Kind of investing in uh, my communication skills. Like, so I want to become more of a, like, especially on my YouTube channel, like be more present, like visibly, so I can uh, film myself communicating with my audience. So I want to reach a point where it's, it looks professional and sounds professional. So like that communication aspect is something I would kind of want to improve on. I think that's really important. And um, just as your friend, as someone who, who has uh, known you for several years, I, I just wanted to share that I have definitely noticed that your communication has improved tremendously in recent years. And I think that's in large part to, it's kind of two things. Number one, it's doing a YouTube show because you're on camera you're kind of forced to practice. But on the other side, I also think it's um, your involvement in community. 
because you're constantly like I see you all over the place. I know that in, in our community, um, we're always chatting, and I think that it, anytime you're answering people's questions and you're just kind of constantly in the rhythm of of talking and communicating, you're gonna improve at that. Um, and I think a myth regarding YouTubing is that you have to have it all together. You have to have this super nice gear. You have to have nice cameras and lights. No, you don't. Um, I think I'm a pretty good example of that. I started with nothing. I still feel like I have nothing. And yet, you know, maybe you don't agree, but um, I just make, I make little investments, little improvements over time. Um, I still don't have really nice equipment because there is a, a point of diminishing returns. In fact, I was just having a chat with another guy in our community uh, a couple weeks ago about lighting of all things. You might look around here and go uh, from your vantage point and be like, oh, Steven has super nice lighting. No, I really, it's a window. <laughs> it's a window and a light. It's like, it's nothing special. And um, it, it's a smart investment. And, and going back to that, as far as gear goes, I also use that same principle of, is this going to be a 10X return? I think we get so gear hungry and happy um just as music nerds we were like oh i need the latest and greatest no you don't um one of my convictions is i only buy gear if it's going to improve the current project and i take it a step further that's what i teach but i take it a step further and i don't buy gear i ask my team and i ask my developers to buy me gear which is might sound bizarre I just, I don't spend money on someone else's product. Because if you think of your music as an asset, it is literally a product that you're selling to a developer. They're buying it. They're hiring me for it. So why not get the upsell? It's just, it's like sales. It's basic marketing. Get the upsell. Hey, um, if you, if you want to toss in an extra 200 bucks, we can use this sample library on there. It's going to sound way better. Or I think... uh, a higher quality than that is, hey, if you can throw an extra thousand bucks, I can hire this cellist I really want to use for this or whatever. And no one ever says no because they're like, uh, yeah, that'd be amazing to have that that upper echelon. And especially when you start talking about live orchestras, that, that changes the game completely. And these are, I'm kind of shocked that these are real conversations I get to have now. I didn't get to have, have these conversations early on because people didn't have budgets. But that's just a, a natural progression as you kind of go forward in your career. You get to have these phone calls of, hey, uh, I know it's going to be about 25,000 extra bucks to record an orchestra for this, but you into it? Yeah, let's do it. And it's just as easy a yes as it was before. It's just a different item, different budget, right? Different people. So it's just fascinating to me. When we meet people, like how does one progress from acquaintances to friends, especially in this like socially distant era we're in? <laughs> Um, that's a good question. Uh, there is a tendency to strip away humanity from business as if they're mutually exclusive, but it's not true. The best projects I've ever had and continue to have are with friends, plain and simple. The best relationships are friends. The best collaborations are with friends. So really the question here is not like, how do I get more business? It's how do I get more friends? And that's, that's its own study in itself. But I think it boils down to being authentic because I am the only me, you are the only you. And in a socially distant world right now, honestly, I think Zoom, just like this, as cheesy as it might be, and as, you know, it can be awkward at times because there's weird pauses and maybe we have a list of questions and, and fun, fun fact, I actually have an interview right after this with another composer. So I'm kind of in the same boat where it's, how do we make this real? How do I make this authentic and not forced? I don't think it matters too much. Like people are pretty forgiving creatures. You know, we can, we can kind of get over it. We're going to be okay. Um, and I think what's unique to this season right now, this 2020 pandemic season is everyone's in it. No one's exempt. So there's almost this global grace given, this global understanding that has never existed in hu- human, you know, humanity. Um, people are more accessible. 
had a chat with another guy a couple weeks ago that asked a very similar question about how do I approach big named people during this season? And honestly, I, I don't even know if I have any good advice. It's just, just do it. Chances are they're going to say yes. And that is what this entire show is, is predicated on people just saying yes. And let me, let me be super honest here that people say yes to chats. Like, and I got to say that um, having one-on-one -on -one personal chats with your heroes, like your composer heroes is one of the coolest things in the world. And the one, one of the best ways to do it is to have a podcast or to have a YouTube show because it gives a platform because ultimately when you ask something of someone else, it should always bring them value. And that might seem weird because we're such a customer culture of let me spend time with you because it benefits me. No, you'll not get anywhere in life doing that. That's very selfish. But instead, if we turn it, you know, today I'm going to spend time with Alec. I'm going to, I'm going to pour into him in some way. I want to, I want to see him succeed, right? That is no different than my conversation after this with an, a triple A list composer, someone I have no business talking to. We don't swim in the same <laughs> pools at all. We, we should not be talking, but we are because I'm going out of my way to provide value for him. I want to make sure that this conversation is not only just fun and energetic and enjoyable, but it helps him in his career. You might be thinking, what, how could, how could I help him in his career? Be creative, find a way. And this is what my entire story is based on. It's finding a way because people, especially in the game industry, People are so kind and so willing to spend time with you. But there's got to be more than, I want something from you. Because that doesn't fly. That's not human. That's, that's not um, relational. But instead, if you offer something, then you can really change the game. And you will forever be known in the mind of that, you know, big person, whatever. They will always think of you, oh man, that's the guy that did that thing for me for free. And I've told this story on the show with, with Gary Scheiman, one of my heroes. Um, and he was a composer I always wanted to work with. I didn't really have an agenda. I just wanted to be around him. I wanted to see how he worked because I loved what he did. Um, and the way I was able to do that is I offered to, this is back when I like just started learning contact. Um, I offered to program his sounds, his own custom instruments. Um, and he was just so intrigued he's like who is this this twerp you know who's this little kid asking me to help me but he he's a very kind human and and obviously that kind of sparked a cool friendship there but more honestly it sparked a mentorship if anything um i got to learn a lot from him and and that event turned into other connections that have just like moved my career and i think in large part it has to do with being willing to do what no one else is willing to do. Um, and I think part of that is persistence. If someone says no, it's usually not no, it's not now. Follow up, follow up, follow up. Um, we might joke about this in the, in the chat afterwards, but um, the guy I'm about to have an interview with, I think this is my eighth or ninth contact with him this year. And it was literally like, once every two, three weeks, just kind of following up. Hey, I know you're busy. I know you're busy. You're an A-list composer. You are busy. You don't have time for me. But I think this is going to be really cool. Like, I'm gonna, this is going to be really valuable. We're going to chat about something that people don't chat about as composers. And, it, and his answer was never no. It was, oh, I'm too busy right now. So I think if, if I could like bestow a superpower on you, it's... Um, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this a lot, actually. Really big um, entrepreneur. He talks about emotional um, intelligence. Not, you know, we talk about IQ, our, our intellectual. Um, but emotional is really important because it helps you read other people. And ultimately, if you are someone who listens and just starts a conversation, that's going to do so much more for you than anything else. So that was a lot of information, but I think in your specific situation, as someone with a YouTube channel, you have a lot of power that you may not know you have. 
you have a lot of leverage because you have a lot of eyeballs watching you on a regular basis, expecting quality from you. So anytime that you can connect those audience members with something that adds value to them, and if you can combine that with providing value for the people you're bringing on board, in the case of an interview, right, you're connecting people and the people who succeed in life are connectors. We don't live on little islands. It doesn't exist. Every good thing that's ever happened in my business is because of other people. Absolutely. I have not done anything in my career that is worthy of the financial compensation or the, the attention and whatever. There's nothing. It's not me. Yes, I can, write, I can write some notes, but that has nothing to do with it. Yes, it's a music business, but it's mostly business. It's mostly relationships. So I think that's a great question, a great mindset to move forward in that I think it's really important for us to always be people first and then apply it to the career. This is why go make friends with everyone because chances are you will get more work. You will get more acceleration in your career by the people around you than anyone you're going to go meet out there, you know, wherever, <laughs> conferences and whatever. Um, it's always the, the people in your inner circle that elevates you and, and push you to the next. Um, and I think things like this, community, uh, composer communities are really big on that. Um, and I, I preach this quite a bit that composers, Brian Schmidt, did, I did a talk with him a couple months ago and um, right before Game SoundCon, and he talked about composers hire composers. You want work as a composer? Get hired by a composer. Because then your name and credits will be on the big projects. Who knows what's going to happen to your career after that? Riding the coattails of successful people is one of the fastest ways to success yourself because you're serving people that are way above you and they're going to bring you up with them every time because you're their friend now. Whoosh, you're up there. And then if we're talking about climbing the ladder, I mean, why climb the ladder one step at a time over 20, 30 years when there's not a shortcut, right? But there's, there's a faster way. <laughs> by far, mm -hmm. uh, when people elevate each other. And I always, like one of my, one of my um, personal convictions is I always want to be someone who's on my back to lift other people up. Because when you have a service mindset, you will always win. Because you're helping other people win. If you help other people win, they'll never forget it. And you'll always, um, they will connect you to every, everyone else in their world. And it becomes this natural, organic networking. Nothing forced, nothing clinical, uh, very relational. So I don't know how we got there from your question, but <laughs> I think we got time for one more question. How do you keep in touch with so many people that I know? Like, do you spend time with just a few people or kind of go with a more broader approach? So like, for example, like on Facebook, like I know like over a hundred people, but how do you like give value to those hundred people or do you focus on just a few people that you uh, know? Okay. Um, I think exclusivity is one of the most important parts of any business. It's not something people talk about at all, but I think as composers specifically, let's talk to composers. Composers want to do everything. They want to write for every, every medium, film, TV, video games, podcasts, uh, movie trailers, blah, blah, blah. And it, ugh, it just becomes this shotgun. I'll take whatever I can get. Those people don't become successful because they're not focused. They might get there eventually. There's always you know, exceptions to every rule. But in general, people don't move because they're... they're I guess paralyzed from inaction. There's too much to do. So how do I do it all? And it just, it becomes this crazy thing. But on the opposite side, if you are exclusive and you do one thing and you do it very well, you become a specialist and specialists are the most revered people in business. They're paid the highest rates. They get the most um, freedom to do their craft because they're known as one thing. If you were to analyze, and honestly, part of this show is analyzing those people and bringing them on the show and talking through their journeys of how did you become the person for this thing? Was it a conscious decision or was it the market that pushed you that way? 
it's usually some combo of both. But uh, you could even take this same approach. You know, I call it micro niching. It's it's whittling down over the course of your career till you are known as one thing. Because you can only really be known as one thing, right? I mean, we, 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 could, we could spend 20 minutes here just picking out what is Bill Gates known for? Boom. Like, duh, Microsoft. PCs. Okay, next. But he's done 3,000 other things. Okay, that's what he's known for. Okay, it's like you could just go through the list of, of famous people after famous person who's done a lot of things in their career, but like they're known for one thing. And when it comes to music, you think of, you know, what is Koji Kondo known for? Zelda, Mario, boom. Has he done lots of other things? Oh, yes. What is Grant Kirkhope known for? Banjo-Kazooie. He's done lots of other things. All right? It's like they are these hallmark moments that once someone decides, I'm going to do this one thing, the rest of their career takes off. And it's just very fascinating. Um, so how do you go deeper? You just got to make some decisions and say no more often. No one likes to say no. Um, but the idea is to, you don't have to have it all figured out. That's probably the best news of all. If you start wide, your career is not ruined. It's not even hurt. It's just not the best. So what's going to happen is if you start wide, make a decision today. Okay, for the next six months, I'm going to just focus on this one lane. Maybe it's just video games that you like to do video games. Okay, let's do games. And then what's going to happen is over time, you're going to get a lot of game work. But you're going to start to figure out, I don't really like to do horror games. I don't really like to do platformers. You're just going to kind of narrow it down. Maybe you become the puzzle guy. And then you kind of go, maybe I should be like the mobile puzzle guy. That's where most puzzle games are. And you just you keep niching down over time. And if you continue to go deeper and deeper and deeper, you become more of a specialist. And the more specialized you become, Instantly, your rates go higher, your notoriety goes higher, and your branding gets very, very clear to the point where your branding becomes one sentence. You become the one sentence brand, you win. It's almost a monopoly because, you know, it, I'm telling you, we could really go on a rant here, but I'm just thinking of, you know, fast food. Just think of McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, whatever. It's like, they're known for one thing. Like, that's the hamburger place. Right? Yes, you could bring in Burger King and Wendy's, whatever, competition, but eh, McDonald's, whether you like them or not, like they're, they're number one. And there's, there's these number ones of each niche because they niched down. They did the one thing amazingly well. They, they made fast food what it is today through their processes and systems. So it's, it's all about specializing, honestly. That's, the, that's the, the trend that I'm seeing more and more the further I get in my career. Because if you try to do more, if you try to specialize in more than one thing, you've already diluted your brand. Because what is your client going to tell his friends when they're looking for, I don't know, I'll pick on myself, a 2D adventure game. That's what I write for. What if their friend is looking for a 2D adventure game, but eh, Steven also does film, eh, he also does podcasts. It's, they're not going to be compelled to share about you. They're not going to network because it's, eh, he's okay. He does a lot of things. Who wants to be known as that? So you, you get my point that by niching down over time, you become so much more specialized and you're able to serve people deeper and you're able to make a larger impact in a more specific way. So that is by far my biggest takeaway from really the last few years of learning what it means to specialize. Those are some really great questions and I hope that that helped you at least a little bit. And as always, you know where to find me online. I hope that, you know, we can continue the conversation from there. But I hope you have a wonderful day. Uh, it really means a lot to me that you take time to help people like me on the journey. All right. Bye-bye, Stephen. All right. Take care, Alec. Bye-bye.